We've been walking through, uh, really what we're doing in this series is walking and talking through this, this thought of, okay, God, I'm crying out to you. I want you to uh, bless the situation that I'm in. Uh, but then as we unpack it, we begin to discover that God indeed wants to bless us in areas of our life, but it also uh, comes with this bit of a caveat that says, okay, if you're going to experience the blessings of God in every or any area of your life, you must also choose to walk on the pathways and journeys that lead us into experiencing those blessings. I shared last week how many people are in financial disarray, and so they cry out and they say, God, I need you to bless my finances in a really big way. And again, God wants to do that, but are you on a track? Are you on the pathway in which God can bless your finances? You know, are you, gonna, are you willing to get out of the mess that you're in and start honoring God and taking steps towards him, or do you just want to keep kind of wallowing in the same mistakes over and over? So, so again, we say, okay, what is required, or what is, is it that God wants from us to actually experience those blessings? Today, I want to talk to you about decision-making. We end up sometimes in life in some really foolish places because of our decision-making and our choices. And then we cry out and we say, God, I need your help. Bless me, oh Lord, bless me. And again, I think God wants to, but are you willing to start operating differently, living differently, making better choices and decisions and walking with God? Or do you want God to bless your mess and also keep living in the mess? Keep living in the messy decisions and choices. I don't know about you. I've made many foolish decisions in my life that have led me into some really odd places uh, because of those decisions. Uh, I'll share one with you. Many years ago, before this church started, my wife and I, we were working in youth ministry and uh, did this for a few years. And, and one year, uh, we thought it'd be really cool at the church that we were at to do something called a living nativity. And this is where you get like live animals and people and you kind of do this nativity. People can drive by and see that nativity. We have music playing. And so we thought it'd be a really good idea. Uh, and so I, I kind of took it upon myself to get this going. And getting the live people was not an issue. It turns out, you know, what the issue was, was getting live animals. And so I had this really bright idea, thought how it all go in my mind. And of course, in the moment, I thought it'd be so easy and simple, no big deal. Uh, but then I start to round up the animals, and really the greatest challenge is I had to find a sheep, and uh, uh, this really turned out to be rather unusual for me. Uh, I made some calls, and I called around, hey, who's got a sheep? You know, I've never done that in my life. Who's got a sheep? And, and I found this place down the road that had one. They said, you are welcome to come get this sheep, you know, for your live nativity. It's no problem. Just bring it back at the end of the night. I was like, all right, this is awesome. So I, I go to the place, and and I roll up in my minivan, and uh, this should have been warning sign number one. I took the seats out the back, because we're going to put the, put the little lammy guy in there, and uh, put a tarp down, because I figure, I don't know, it's only a 10-minute ride, but it might go to the bathroom. I, I shared this with some folks one other time in another setting, but I was like, you know, I thought this, in my mind, it's going to work out fine. I see the sheep, it's like a... Uh, almost like a mini cow in size. You know, it's a large thing. And so now somehow I got to get it in the van. So this thing we're lifting up, you know, we're getting it up into the, into the van there in the back, the back of it. We shut the minivan door. This thing is so large. I used to have a photo of it. I, I couldn't find it for this, this time here with you. But this thing had its head over my shoulder while I was driving. So we got a picture of it. It's right there, you know, so large. And uh, then what begins to happen is on this 10-minute journey, quickly, very quickly, uh, the animal is pooping and peeing all over the back of the minivan. If you know how a sheep does this, it's like little whoppers, you know, they look like little whoppers, and they're starting to roll, and they come out just massive amounts, you know, and they're rolling all over the back of, I'm like, what is going on? I thought it would just be, again, I don't know how they go to the bathroom or whatever, but it's only a 10-minute ride, but really, if you were a sheep in a minivan being transported around town, wouldn't you probably poop and pee a little bit too? Like, this is crazy chaos. And so then, uh, you know, it's peeing and puddles and pouring is pouring out pee as well. I did put tarp down, but I didn't put enough. And it's sloshing over the tarp, under the tarp. We get there. 
do our little event, load it back up and take it back across town and drop it back off. Can I just tell you that for weeks and months and years, the smell in that minivan, I think we found those little whoppers and crevices, you know, it was there for a long time. Now, you laugh at my terrible decision, but my little sheep story is the story for many of you in very real outcomes in your life that have been very real messy and have left you in not just with urine in your carpets, but some really rough places. And God cries out to humanity and says, no, you, you don't have to operate that way. You, you, you can get real wisdom, real godly wisdom. You know, one of the things that happens in your childhood that should happen is that your parents... As you're growing up, they invest in you daily, teaching you godly wisdom. It's the way God set it up. But I know many of you, you would say, well, I didn't get that. My parents didn't give me godly wisdom to make great decisions in my life. Okay, and I'm sorry that that happened, but you're still not left empty. You can go to God's word and get incredible wisdom for your life and start producing healthier outcomes with better decision making going forward the Bible tells us that when you are living a life void of healthy decision-making from God, you are living life as though you are a fool. I don't want you, God said, I don't want you to live as a fool, but you're living life as a fool. We, we have a lot of people in our culture today who don't look at themselves as foolish because they've got a degree, two degrees, three degrees, been to college all these years, got all this information in front of them from life. They think that they are kind of like highly well-educated, and that may be in the terms of this world, but the Bible says that without the things of God, the knowledge and wisdom of God, they are still living as fools, still living a foolish way of life, foolish decisions. I've made them, you've made them. For some of you, maybe you met somebody in first few weeks of the relationship, you just were on cloud nine and everything's amazing in those first few weeks and you just decided to go get married. Now, you didn't care to kind of unpack and know who this person is and some of the trauma from their life and their past. You just said, this is a really bright idea. Let's go get married. And then months and years later, you start to uncover, maybe weeks later, oh my goodness, you know what happened. These are decisions we make without the wisdom of God. For some of you, you gave up your sexual purity. And it was a moment where it seemed like it would be okay, it's no problem. I mean, after all, you know, uh, uh, this guy said he would always be there for me, and so that made it okay. And then he wasn't. But in the moment, it seemed like, okay, maybe this is a, a good decision. There's no godly wisdom there. You just did it in the emotion, and in the moment, you quit college because you were tired or exhausted or some other bright idea came your way and then years later you're like, man, why in that moment did I quit college like we talked about last week? You know, you get the credit line so you can acquire the thing and buy it. Expending money and getting credit lines that we can't afford to pay back and now, years later, you're living in service to the debt master. For some of you, your marriage has been void of godly wisdom, and you put everything else first but your marriage. You put your job first. You put your career first. That's foolish living. There's no godly wisdom in that. Uh, for some people, I've seen this happen over the years, uh, instead of living with godly wisdom for their marriage, they put their kids ahead of everything else. And then after 20, 25 years of raising the children in the home, the kids leave, they're empty nesting, and they go, I don't even know you. But they never invested in each other. That's a lack of godly wisdom, foolish living for many, many years of life. This famous text that we did a couple of uh, months ago, I'll put it back up on the screen. Mark 8, Mark 8, 36 says, For what shall it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world but lose his what? His soul, your soul. This is where many people are today. They think they're so incredibly smart and intelligent, but they are soulless people. A soulless way of living is something that many people in our culture today are like, oh, they've got the stuff, and they got the moments of emotion where they feel better about life, 
and they let this kind of on repeat way of living go over and over in the day to day living of their life and they come to the end of their life and they're very soulless. Oh, it was a great idea in the moment, but there was no wisdom and so it turned out to be very foolish. We are the most educated culture in the history of the world, yet our culture is collapsing in folly more than ever before. We've got more data. We're drowning in data, yet wisdom is missing. We've got more information at our fingertips, yet we walk right into foolishness all the time. We can travel farther and quicker than ever before, yet so many of us are traveling farther and quicker in the wrong direction than ever before. Wisdom, we're talking about something that goes beyond earthly knowledge, beyond the textbooks, beyond the little area of our life that we're an expert at. We're getting a 30,000 foot view of life information to guide us and direct us from our, for our life that is God-given knowledge and wisdom. I pray for wisdom. I want wisdom for my life. You should pray for wisdom and want wisdom for your life. I pray as I teach. I can give you wisdom so that you will discover wisdom, God-given information from his word so that you could take it with you and live a different way of living. I want wisdom for my marriage. I want wisdom for the way I've raised my children or now as my children are gone out of the home, I pray that they discover wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. I mentioned that before. And so this means that in your life, you have to decide Okay, I know there's, there's something important about IQ. Our culture talks about what's your IQ. What is that? Your intelligence quotient. But God says, hey, 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 there's something bigger than IQ. It's called GQ. And I'm not talking about gentlemen's quarterly. I'm talking about a God quotient. What is your God quotient in the way that you make your decisions and choices in life? What is your God quotient for the way that you start seeking the things of God before some of the moments of crisis and difficulty that you're going to face. When you start to live a life not born out of your emotions, not born out of like whatever wind is in my sails today, that's the direction I'm going to go. But no, by a foundation, a genesis for your life that is founded on the things of God to make quality choices. When you get in that position, you start to make amazing decisions as you negotiate the maze of life. We're going to look at just some information in Proverbs for decision making. I've talked about Proverbs over the years. I've talked about how important Proverbs is. Uh, I'll remind you what I think many of you know about Proverbs, but I'll, I'll remind you of this again. There are 31 chapters in Proverbs. And so many times what a Christian will do as they're introduced to Bible reading and doing that for the first time in their life, they will start to read one chapter a day of Proverbs. And they go 31 chapters, 30, 31 days in a month, and they'll read one chapter. And then the next week, or the next year, or the next month, they'll read, they'll read again, one chapter a day, one chapter a day. And they'll just keep doing it over and over. Every month, keep reading the same chapters. Why do they do that? Why would people keep reading the same chapters every month in the Bible? It's because those people that are reading it understand that Proverbs gives some, dishes out some of the most incredible information for your life and for the year 2024. It is powerful wisdom. You're here today and you're younger. You have an opportunity to grab a hold of quality decision making for the future of your life in a very powerful way to have much better outcomes than maybe some of us that might be a little bit older than you. But if you're older here, it's never too late to start grabbing a hold of quality decision making or reading Proverbs to remind you day in and day out of how to have better decision making. By the way, you want your relationship, relationships to be better in life? Read Proverbs. You want your job situation to go a little bit better in life? Read Proverbs. You want to know how to deal with temptation? Read Proverbs. Adultery, wealth, success, how to discover right friends, right living as a man, right living for a woman, taking the initiative in life. All of these relevant things in life are found in Proverbs. So this is why many people, they'll read a chapter of Proverbs a day, but then they'll read a chapter from another book of the Bible as well. And they kind of work through the Bible uh, doing that. There's all kinds of ways you can do this, but I'm trying to get you to understand the value of Proverbs. I don't know if you know this. Uh, the writer of Proverbs is Solomon. 
I've shared before that he is considered the wisest man to ever live. He was completely, highly intelligent in the things of the world, earthly knowledge. But then he was known to have incredible godly knowledge or godly wisdom. And people would come from all over to hear him speak because of what he had at his, his ability to share and dish out with so many people. And, and, and this book in Proverbs, as we unpack a few things from it, is given to us in an even more rich way of understanding because God himself made an appearance to Solomon and dished out information, and now we have that in Proverbs. We believe the entire book of the Bi- entire Bible, all the books of the Bible, are God inspired. But there are times where we get writings in the bo- in, in in books of the Bible that come from something called a theophany. A theophany is when somebody actually visibly saw God and started writing. And when in those moments you get that. You say, man, you know, this is direct, like direct information from God. This is powerful. This is rich information. God appears to Solomon and says, Solomon, hey, what do you want? Wouldn't that be pretty amazing if God appeared to you and just said, hey, what do you want? It's like genie in a bottle moment, right? It's like, what did, oh, my goodness, I can have anything. What, do I, what did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. And what a smart thing to ask for, of course, because if I have godly wisdom, I, I have it in decision-making outcomes in every area of my life. So yes, of course, I ought to want, I ought to want wisdom. I put this in your notes. You need real wisdom to make better choices in life or you will live out an exhausting race in life built on self-improvement. Here's what I mean. So many people are running the stadium steps of life up and down and they are in exhaustion. If I were to gather a group of people outside the doors of this church that aren't here today, just kind of in our community on the street, wherever, and I would just say, are you tired in life? Many people would say, I'm, I'm exhausted. Many people would say that. In fact, probably there are many people in this room right now, you would say, I'm exhausted in life. I'm tired. And you know how one of the key ways we get exhausted and tired in life is when we go in directions opposite of God. And our culture is filled with people today more than ever before going opposite of the things of God. And so, of course, they're tired. They're exhausted from the debt master of money. They're exhausted from the damage of their broken relationships. They're exhausted from going in the wrong direction with their purpose in their life. They're exhausted trying to be a clone of everybody else and trying to copy everybody else in life and not being the original you that God made you to be. And so, yes, we deal with exhaustion when we kind of get ourselves into these unhealthy places. And then what we do to try to get out of that mess, again, instead of turning to God, you know, we get in self-help, self-improvement, because we'll just kind of buy this book with the five steps to healthy living, and, and we'll buy this book with the three steps here, and we'll watch a podcast and try to get inspired. But none of that leads us to the healthy place that God wants us to get to in our life. So we've got to decide, am I going to rely on self-improvement or am I going to turn to God wisdom? I do want to say this. If you're here today and you're a young person and you're in your 20s like me, you have a great great opportunity to really uh, get this, to dig into this and find yourself living in very different outcomes for you. Proverbs, I've given some background about how critical it is. Don't forget, if you ever want to, you just want to listen to Proverbs, you know there's apps for that. You can, uh, the most common Bible app, and in fact, the most downloaded in the history of the world app is the Bible app. It is uh, called, uh, it's called, it's brought by Life Church. It it's called version. so if you download that or down, just search uh, Bible on, on uh, Google Play or your Apple Store, you can find that Bible, and it actually will let you press play and hear the Word of God being read into your ears. We have an app. Our church has an app, New Walk Church. I don't know if you know that, uh, but we have an app. Again, it's available for free on Google Play and Apple Store, and it has uh, devotionals. It has uh, the Bible there for you to, to read and listen to as well. So maybe you'll leave here and download uh, the New Walk Church app as well. Of course, we're always giving information about things that are going on in our church, but we'll be mostly in Proverbs chapter 1 just for a second and Proverbs chapter 2. Here's what it says in your notes. We're talking about how to make better choices in life. Here's where it starts. It starts with the fear of God. 
there has to be a moment in your life where you say, okay, for me to experience the blessings of God, I probably then ought to start having more of a reverence for God, right? When we're making poor decisions on our own, we're doing that in our flesh. We're doing that and kind of putting ourselves in charge, not God. And there has to be a time where you come to a moment and say, no, God is large and in charge. He is worthy of me humbling myself before him. He is an incredible, mighty God, and he has powerful wisdom for my life. Until you come to that place, you are not in position to step out of your foolishness. You will continue in your folly until you're ready to say, God, I recognize you and all the authority that you have to offer. Proverbs 1 and 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of this godly knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. God gives us so much access to wisdom. We have God the Father, who is a God of wisdom. We have God the Son, who came down into the flesh and showed us wisdom here on earth. It's recorded in the Word. And then he left with us the Holy Spirit of God to indwell in us and guide us and give us direction for life. We literally have access to Trinity wisdom coming from all different places and all different angles for, for our life, ultimately the one source of the Heavenly Father. First Corinthians chapter 1, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were noble at birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And so this is that point of that fear of the Lord that, hey, I'm, I'm going to lower a little bit of my own God complex You should get rid of all of that and say, okay, now you're in charge. You're running the show, God. And and when God gets involved in that, he takes people, no matter what your background is, or this text is saying, you you didn't come from noble birth. Maybe you didn't read all the books that you were supposed to read in class. And maybe, uh, you know, you didn't have it all together. But God takes anybody and everybody who wants to seek him and put him first. And he can download wisdom that the world doesn't even understand. They'll call us crazy. They'll call us folly. But they're the ones living in folly because they don't have this grand bit of information, this expansive bit of information that God is revealing to humanity. It goes on, it says this, it's because of him that you are in Christ, Jesus who has become for us the wisdom of God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. He brought us wisdom. Therefore it is just written, let no one, if it, let, let the one that boasts, boast in the Lord. So if you would humble yourself this morning, and say, God, I, I see you as in charge. You're taking this first step. You know the word fool, when you see it written, it doesn't mean stupid. Somebody, again, could have amazing education. And I'm, I'm all for education. I think it's great. But you could have amazing education and still be a fool. It's mentioned 70 times in Proverbs, that word fool. It comes from this Hebrew word, nabal. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that Nabal is also a, a character in, in the Bible. In 1 Samuel 25, 25, you'll find this reference, some things there about his life. And people said Nabal was a fool, and he was a fool in the way that he lived. Uh, how was he a fool? Well, what he did was he had everything in life, and at the end of the day, he had nothing. Welcome to 2024. A lot of people who have a lot of things, America, this great nation, and yet they have a lot of things, and yet at the end of the day, they're found wanting. They're found having nothing. And so Solomon is reminding you and I in the scriptures about Nabal. Solomon is reminding you and I over and over, hey, don't be a fool. Don't live as a fool. I put this in your notes. Here's what it is. Fools are open to anything and everything, and they believe in nothing. Wisdom is doing life through God's perspective. Fools think they have everything, but in the end, they're empty. The people who add add a God perspective to their life are the ones that are expanding out of sort of the small earthly way of living. Wisdom comes from God, and so we're seeking God 
for the information that we need. Proverbs 1 and 20 says this. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She, it references in the feminine. People say, why is that in the feminine? Because the word wisdom has an effeminate attachment to it in its grammar, grammatically. Uh, and so the way it's written, it's written in the feminine here. She raises her voice in the open square. She cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gate of the city. She speaks her word, cries out to you and I in these moments we're at the crossroads of making a big decision in our life. God says, I am here. I'm not playing games. It's not some sort of a guy in the cosmic clouds that you can never get information from. God says, I am there. I'm available. I'm crying out to you right now. Don't go get that sheep and put it in your van. Like, don't do it. Don't do it, right? It's in moments like that, if you would be in tune to him, you would hear his voice. He will make it known to you. There's no games. Cries out in the city square, in the concourses, that information is there for you and I. How long, you simple ones, will you live, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge. I'll pause there for, for just a moment. The reference here in, in Proverbs is that people without godly knowledge are simpletons. They live a very simple life. They live a life, again, on emotions. What a simple way of living. They live a life confined to the earthly things. What a simple way of living. They live a life of, of here today, gone tomorrow, and wherever the wind takes me today is where I'll go. There's no firm foundation for their life. Simpletons. I was sharing last week when we were talking about our financial situations in life and how, you know, we got to be careful because if we're not paying attention, we will make so many of our financial decisions born out of emotions. And that's what's happening in our culture today. Many people are in an unhealthy place financially because you know what they do? When I said this last week. Uh, when they're sad, they go buy things to make themselves feel better. And also when they're happy, they go spend their money because they're so happy. And when they're bored, you know what they do? They go buy things because they're bored. And now you got all this money being dished out on emotions and we end up in debt and we end up in chaos. We end up, you know, up to our, our eyeballs in this debt. And, and so God says, I, I don't want you to live like that. I want you to make a plan, a God-given plan for your money, for your resources, so that when these moments come, you're following an order, you're following a foundation, not just operating on emotions. That's how we can make sure our financial life is in a better place. I, by the way, some of you may not have been here last week. I offered a free gathering that we're doing on December 1st before we get too far into the Christmas season where you can come and get information about how to get a budget going. We're doing a, a short little overview of Financial Peace University where you can come. It's free. You, bring, you bring, bring your family. We got kids care, husband and wife. You can be a part of that. We'll download to you some very powerful information about how to step away from the emotions of finances, how to bring order to it, no more chaos. We're going to give you that, just a brief overview of it, help you with a few little tools before it kind of begins. So I, I put that back up there before the holidays begin. You have an opportunity to be a part of that. If you are interested, you weren't here last week, you can tell us write FPU for Financial Peace University on the back of your Connect card, little card you got when you came in. Circle it so we see it really clearly when we go through those. And we will, if you give us good contact information, we'll send you an invite to that and give you more information about it. That's on December 1st after this service right here at the church. I said this last week. I'll remind you again of it. If you are married, this would be something that you wouldn't just send one of you to attend, you, you would both come to. Because oftentimes we see this, there'll be a woman comes there, the wife comes, and she gets all this critical information about how to bring order to their finances, and she goes home and presents it to her husband, and he says, stick it. We're not doing that. So you want to both be on the same page and be in this together if you're going to bring order to your, to your finances. So Financial Peace University gets us out of simple living. It gets out of simpleton type of living. It gets away from emotions. It gets us away from this time and thing in our life where we go, I just need to follow my heart. I just need to go with my feelings. Wherever I end up, it's okay. That's simpleton living. There's something so much more for you and I to discover that simpleton living can be influenced also by people we hang out with. Before I move on to the next part, I was just reminded that, you know, in Proverbs, it actually says that a companion of fools suffers harm. 
if we want to get out of foolish living, we got to make sure we're not surrounded by fools as well in our decision making, in our life. This is about the relationships that we keep. I, I was just thinking about it from the realm of social media. How many of you scrolled this week on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, whatever, and you saw, did you see as you were watching the videos and the posts, did you see a lot of godly wisdom being posted there? No. Many of us don't. That, that's a companion of fools. Even online, you can have a companion of fools that you, that you get kind of fed into your brain and into your mind. So you got to be careful about that. I put this in your notes. Now, we're not just going to have a mindset that, God, you are there, you are real, you are powerful, you are amazing. But also, I put this in your notes, you have to develop a repentive heart, a repentant heart. Now, I, anytime I talk about the word repent, I always like to share it because there are many people visiting with us and they're scared to death of that word and the primary reason they're scared to death of that word is because they went to a church and there was a pastor there and he was screaming, repent! And it scared you just as he was doing that thing and you were like, I don't know what that means, but I'm scared of that word. It simply means, it's an important word, it simply means that I'm leaving my old way of living behind, my poor choices, all, and I want to turn towards the things of God. That's what repentance means. I turn away from something, turn towards, ultimately turning towards God. And, and so you have to decide, okay, that, that this is critical for my, my life. It's one thing to say, okay, God, you're there, you're real amazing, but also are you ready to turn and start following him? Many people are crying out, God bless us, in their, in their relationship. They're involved in a relationship. They're not yet married. And it's going badly, it's going poorly, and they're crying out, we need help, God, we need help. And they're literally living together, playing house. This is, a no, this is a no condemnation house. And so if this is your story, I'm just trying to help you understand how incredibly difficult it is to experience a blessing in your relationship when you're currently not willing to turn away from the old way of living and start following God's wisdom for your life. And so you have to decide, hey, we're not going to play house. We're going we're gonna to put this in proper order so that now we can ex start experiencing the things that God wants for us in our situation. And so we get out of this old way. We turn towards the things of our Heavenly Father. That in itself is repentance. I have been marveling still three weeks later that just a few weeks ago, we had 119 people baptized here on a weekend at our church. That was amazing. Some of those folks that were baptized are right here in this audience right now. And I want to remind those of you who made that decision, what were you pronouncing in that moment as you were being baptized? You were literally saying, my old life is being buried, my old way of living. I am raised to life and new life through Jesus Christ. You were saying in that moment when you were baptized, I don't want to live this way any longer. I want to move towards the things of God in my life. And so I put that reminder there to say that's a commitment that you were making to turn away from that old way of living. By the way, if you were not just baptized three weeks ago, but a month ago, years ago, 10 years, 30, 40 years ago, you also made that commitment to turn from this way and turn towards God. And why are so many people turned off of our faith and church is because they see people who are out there that call themselves Christians, but they still live this way instead of following the things of God ultimately for their life. Side note, this is why we don't baptize babies here at our church. Well, a couple reasons. Number one, baptizing babies is not in the Bible. But number two, we don't baptize babies because when we see a baptism in the scriptures, it always follows a personal decision to walk away from my sinful way of living, a personal choice that I made, and turn towards the things of Jesus. And when you come to that place in your life where you're ready to make that decision, you say yes to Jesus, you receive the forgiveness of your sin, and then baptism follows that expression, that public expression of your faith saying, I am walking away with God's forgiveness of that old way of living to a new way of living in my life. And so, we delve into saying, God, you are large and in charge. I want to turn away from that old way of living. I become a spirit-fed living believer. Proverbs 1.23, surely I will pour out my spirit 
on you. Follow me, I will pour out my spirit. God says you can be guided by the spirit of God. That's a part of the Trinity that indwells in the believer that prompts us to, this is not a good decision, move this direction. Follow the things of the spirit of God for healthy living in your life. This is what believers do. Uh, Our church, the foundations of our church, we started our church, and one of the reasons we started our church is so that when people would come to this church, they would get wisdom for their life and stop living as fools. And so I want this for all the people that are within the sound of my voice, I bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus is John 10, 10, that he has come so that you may have life and have it to the fullest, not the foolish, but to the fullest. We have an enemy, it goes on and says, that lies to you and I and takes us down roads that lead us into unhealthy places, but God's reminder to you and I and the gift of Jesus is you don't have to live like that. You can start living a different way. So this church is founded on that. We want that for our entire community. And the more people that live in wise decision making, the better their homes, their families, their marriages, relationships are. And so we want that and we proclaim that all the time here at our church. It's one of the reasons why Christmas at Newark is such a big deal here because hundreds and hundreds of people that have never come to this church will come and hear the message of Jesus Christ. It's why we do the Christmas offering. And I talked about this last week. Some of you weren't here. There's cards on your seats talking about the Christmas offering. I'll do this for those that weren't here. I just share it with you a little bit about the Christmas offering. Maybe you're new to our church and you don't know what it is. The card gives you a little bit of information. Uh, it's a card you're going to take home with you and pray about. But we, here's how we fund this at our church. We fund it together at our Christmas offering. And so you got an opportunity to be a part of that. And what I'm asking is simply this. Everybody's different in how they can be involved, but I'm asking everybody to do something and be involved in our Christmas offering. If this is your church home, On the front of the card uh, for the Christmas offering, you see what we're doing with our invitations to our community. Also, uh, some work in the Dominican. Our our Dominican missionary pastor will be with us here on the stage in two weeks, and he's going to share some things that are going on in the Dominican. And then on the back, you'll see the different levels that you can get involved in. And I shared with the crowd last week, don't just drop, check off a box, and oh, that's really easy, we'll just do that. No, take it home. Take the card home, pray about it, and then come back. And then you can drop it in the bucket. Some of you were here last week, and you're already ready to do that and make that commitment, and I encourage you to go ahead and do that. Maybe you're still praying about it. Again, those of you that are new, uh, you're taking it home. You're going to take it home, pray about it with your you're married with with your wife or with your family and say, this is what we're going to do together. And everybody's capacity is different. I've been challenging people over the years, whatever the most earthly gift that you're going to give that will rust and be in a garage sale in a few years, give bigger than that to the kingdom of God for our ability to share the gospel over our Christmas experiences that weekend. I do ask that before the month is out, You make your commitment, and I shared last week that for whatever it is that you commit to, we give you uh, all the the way through the end of December to keep, you know, plucking away at that little, you know, gift that you've committed to. You don't have to give it all at once. You can if you want, or you can give little by little each week to fulfill whatever it is you're committing to. So we make it as easy on you as possible, and you start by filling out the card when you're done praying and dropping it in the bucket. We're talking about a wisdom that understands there's things that are beyond the things of this earth, things that are revealed to us about the things of God. We dealt with that some last week. I wanted you to hear, I mentioned before in our time together, how valuable it is when young people get this right. There's a couple in our church, and they figured out how like, to use God's wisdom for their finances, how to have God get involved in their finances, but more than that, just for life in general and value of what this church has brought for them and then ultimately the wisdom of God through the word of God. I want you to hear from a couple in our church, a young couple it has been around our church quite a while. Here's what they wanted to share with you. This is Drew and Sarah Drinkwater. My name is uh, Drew Drinkwater. Uh, this is my wife, Sarah Drinkwater. Uh, we've been married together now for about three and a half years and uh, been attending this church together uh, and together for about seven years. What kickstarted our giving intentionally was last December. It was the Greater Things campaign, um, but usually it's a Christmas giving around that time. Uh, well, us as a family started giving 20% uh, just to try to challenge ourselves and step out. The prayer situation in our household and uh, reading the Bible together is 
for me really what wanted my heart to change directions, only because I was starting to see finally, uh, I think, what God can do through someone like me, uh, not just as an organization like a church, but that I have a role I can play as well. Yeah. Christmas services bring hundreds of new faces into this church every single year. Um, and just seeing the impact and during those Christmas services, seeing those lights go in the air. Um, I know tithing has a role to play in getting some of those people here. I would recommend it to people because that percent that we give from that paycheck affects eternity, someone else's eternity. And also I will say, since we have started giving, we have so much more faith and it is so much, we're so free because we don't have to worry about the 10% that's coming out of our paycheck because we know that he provides. The lives that are changed on events like Christmas and Easter here at the church uh, are extreme. Uh, it's for a lot of people, very life-changing. For us, it was life-changing because our plans were uh, as our human plans and God took those human plans and made something way more unimaginable than what we could have ever come up with. And I think giving during these times, uh, yourself, ourselves, uh, really shows the community who may not know God uh, to bring Jesus into their lives. and. and show that growth, which is generational. I'm here because my parents uh, came to church. Uh, they believed in God, and now we have a part that we're being able to play um, just as young adults who are trying to seek that relationship and that strong faith. And I love seeing how far the drink waters have come. Let's give it up for them. Uh, for the record, Drew has been at this church since the first day, so uh, he's been in our church 18 years. He was an itty-bitty back then, but I've watched and loved seeing him grow on his journey and start to get this really for his life. It's, um, it's been valuable for him, and this wisdom that we're talking about that takes us into a new way of living, so powerful for younger people, for older people. We work on this together. We ultimately were spirit-fed and then wisdom and guidance given, given to us in a way that we have received it. I put in your notes, received from God's Word, and we are able to study it. Again, we've been talking about that. We study God's Word. We get wisdom. The Spirit guides us along the way. Spirit comes to life through the words as well that are on the pages that we're reading. Proverbs 1, 23, I will make my words known to you. And we take all of that fear of God and that heart that turns away from the old way of living, the commitment to let the Spirit of God start guiding us, letting the words on the pages, that wisdom get infiltrated into our hearts, and we start to transform into healthier decisions, and then God can bless. Or, I put in your notes, stay a fool. You get the choice, because God loves us. He gives us choice, freedom to choose Him or not. And you could choose his ways or you could not choose his ways and continue to be a fool. Proverbs 1, 24 says, because I have called you and you refused and I stretched out my hand and no one regarded. I'll stop right there. I just want to warn you. This is the ultimate biblical buzzkill that I'm about to read. It's tough to hear. But what I'm about to read to you is the reminder <laughs> that there comes a time when all of our things that we've been living for and craving for, we, we ignored the things of God, we ignored His wisdom for our life, we lived this soulless life, there comes a time where it, it ends and there's, there's no going back. Our God is a graceful God. He wants to pour out grace to you and I when we finally realize that we need to come home to Him. But the scriptures are gonna remind you and I, but there's a time where that grace ends and it's done. And it's no longer available to you and I. And it goes on and it says this. It says, because you disdained all my counsel and you've had none of my rebuke, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock your, when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress 
and anguish come upon you, they, then they will call on me, and I will, but I will not answer, and they will seek me diligently, but they won't, they will not find me. If you spend all of your life being an adversary to God, you will experience an eternity that comes with those who have been an adversary of God in His ways. And it's just the real deal. So we need to know that we have an opportunity to follow him for our life. Proverbs 2 and 1 says, My son, if you receive my words and you treasure my commands within you, you, so, you so that you incline your ear to wisdom, if you, will, if you will let yourself hear the wisdom of God, which is available to all of us, and apply it to your life. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, and lift your voice of un, for understanding. If you seek her wisdom as silver and search for her in all the hidden treasures, for all the hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of, of God that's available to us. You know, as I close out, I'm reminded of something in this thought of hearing from God and how he wants to make sure he's known to us. I'm reminded of my, at my house, I have... Um, I've shared with you over the years, I have a cat in my house, and I don't want to take time to talk about how I got a cat, but we have a cat there, and uh, something our cat loves to do is go out on the patio, and it gets really quiet, and it perks its ears up, and it listens until it hears a lizard, and then it goes and gets the lizard, brings it in the house, and puts it at our feet, and I don't have any idea why it does that, but it does that, and it's very proud of itself and excited, but I've noticed that that lizard goes out on the patio and just quietly says, okay, I'm, I'm listening for the sound of that scurrying. I can't even hear it, but somehow the cat hears it. And that way that that cat operates reminds me of how God reveals himself to you and I, that if we'll just get still and quiet for just a little bit, though the rest of the noisy world can't hear it, if we'll just get quiet, God says, I will absolutely make myself known to you. You will hear my voice. You will see me. If you seek me, you will find me. You just need to pause and say, in these moments of decisions and crisis in my life, God, I want to hear from you and not operate in my emotion and not operate in the flesh of my life. Let's pray together. And God, we're ready to... Um, turn to you more for our healthy decisions. We cry out for your blessing, but we got to stop messing and we've got to stop turning away from you, turn towards you. There's maybe believers here that have been believers for 20, 30, 40 years and God, you're speaking to them right now about a need to turn from some ways of living that look just like the world, that look just like their life before they were a believer. And so God, you're calling them out in some critical wisdom and decision making. Some new believers here are committed to studying God's word, maybe reading Proverbs and some other scriptures to gain more wisdom in their life and taking this seriously for their future as they fulfill this commitment to turn away from the old way and turn towards the things of God. There's perhaps a new believer amongst us, I believe, probably many in this room right now. And you're exhausted and you run the stadium steps of life up and down. With no mission, no guidance, no purpose. Chasing things out of emotion. It's left you empty. God says, I don't want you to live that way. I want to fill you. I want to, I've come to give you life and give it to the fullest for you. I've created a way in which every human being, and they've been doing this by the squillions for 2,000 years, they've been coming to the Heavenly Father and turning away from their old exhausting way of living. They're saying yes to God. God says, I want you in my family, and you can come into my family today if you will be forgiven of your sin. Because only forgiven people are in the family of God. And right now, you can receive his forgiveness just right where you're at. You can say, God, I am ready be forgiven of this old way of living, the times where I chose to go against you. I want to turn towards you today. I'm ready to be washed and cleansed, not because of anything I did, but God, because of what you did on the cross for humanity, a once and for all perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin for every human being, past, present, future, all sin can be forgiven. And so God, I turn to you today. I'm ready for a new journey in life as I learn to trust you and let you guide me going forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.